and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are, after doing the long, long, long affair with all of the expertises, and yet it's still shorter than some of the feat lists we saw back back in the early 2000s with 3rd edition. hey it is It is time for us to tackle and somewhat re-tackle a aspect of Chapter 3 that we, ha- that we didn't get to uh, last week because we, because we were running long in the tooth as it was. Indeed. And that is the Arcane Rules. And we've, we've touched upon it a couple times whenever we were talking about casting classes, but this is the one time where we're going to go a bit more in-depth with it as well as address the mystic spell tree, which is, the, which is essentially the universal spells. Mm-hmm. The other, well, while there are certain spell trees associated with the classes we've tackled, those are exclusive to this one. This, it, the mystic tree is available to anyone who, not, ju- not just, any, any, basically anyone who's got one point in our canting. <laughs> yep, they get access to a certain number of mystic spells. As, as we've pointed out in the past, gishing is stupid easy in this game. Like con- contrast the gishing that you need to do here with the gishing you need to what you need to do to do gish in any edition of D anD D, for instance. Mm, um, Multi classing, I love it. <laughs> said no one ever I'm all, I'm a, I'm always hesitant to even do pres, even do prestige classes if only be, if only because of the fact that with prestige classes you have to deal with prep with prepping so that you qualif- so that you can qualify which means taking stuff that you normally wouldn't take yep final fantasy 1 did prestige classes better you just need a rat's tail What, no love for the job crystals in 14? Hey, hey now, hey now, hey now. I am I am showing how something as ancient as older editions mm-hmm. of D&D did it better than D&D. Yeah. Even if they were partially, technically, sort of, kind of inspired by D&D. And... To be fair, the to be fair, the early days of multiclassing were a bit more jank than what than they are now. A bit. Okay, yeah, I'm not fooling anyone. It's about as j- <clears throat> it's about as jank as um, Creed. <laughs> Spelled with a K. You know the one. <laughs> Not as jank, not as jank as chasm because chasm is actually good. But is it as jank as chank Uger? I do not feel like feeding the water buffalo. <laughs> I'd rather save water buffalo references to the Flintstones. Okay. Fair. Now. We have talked. We have talked about ca- We have talked about casting to an to an extent, and why even even you and I, people who have, I'd say a little bit of a bias regarding casters in RPGs, don't have that problem with Veil of the Void's take. Yeah, because they don't uh, monopolize and uh, overshadow. Uh, scenes mm-hmm. and, and you know we praised the same thing with heavens and heresies but that's you know also because that game did it better <laughs> yeah and as i pointed out on twitter earlier today there there's some interesting things that the casting system does here that we don't see in other games 
Yeah. I think the most interesting one to me is the charge states simply because of the fact that uh, it's a built-in mechanism to prevent Nova. Mm-hmm. Which we will we will do a refresher on that fr- on that front. Yeah. Oh. Um, that being said, there's uh, there's a couple um, clarifications that need to be made from last week, okay. and the, these were ones that that um that Trevor did put in the comments for the video last week, but I want to go over them here. Yeah. Um, Weren't some of them direct direct uh, direct uh, responses to some of my questions too? Yeah. One was in regard to blood magic. Mm-mm. Blood magic does not raise the charge state. <laughs> Which I'm perfectly fine I'm perfectly fine with because it means that it, it means that non-casters have a reason to take it and even casters have a reason to take it because I think as it was it would it would make sense for for someone who's dipping into magic to take it but if you're if you if if you're say a primalist or a mi- or a mimic, it didn't make sense to take it mm. with it with the assumption that we had. Yeah. And second, he did clarify the whole multiple choice expertise thing. Um, that expertise with multiple choices can be taken up to twice. Yep. <clears throat> Which is reasonable, in my mm. opinion. Very reasonable. Don't so, want to allow people to take an expertise to get everything in it, but you do want to allow them to at least take some larger chunks of it than just the one. You can be a polygot, you just can't be a C three PO level polygot. Yes. Also was, polyglot. Polyglot. Oh, of course. Every time I say that, I keep I keep thinking of polyglock. Whenever I think of it, I think of polymath. Because <clears throat> the polymath is someone who just has a lot of skills and a lot of different things. Yeah. Substantial number of subjects. Whereas a polyglock is the newest invention by Doc Glock. <laughs> and given that given that you have characters with multiple arms, I could get away with making a Doc Glock character. <laughs> yes, Monk, you could make a dwarf who are taller as tall as us and mm-hmm. have four arms into dot lock even better if we if when we get to the equipment next week and there's so, and there is extra arm cybernetics i haven't checked oh. if there i haven't checked if there is or isn't yet if there if there is that if there is that's going to be a laugh yeah i haven't checked either so but but with that said, let's get right into the arcane rules, the second half of our look at Chapter 3. Yep. Now, uh, as some of you may remember, when we got to the first casting class, the Necromancer, um, we did take a cursory look at these, looking at some of the specific things that were going to affect all casters no matter what, in order to at least get a... Uh, a uh, you know no no fluff understanding of magic. Here we're going to expand upon that. Mm-hmm. So it opens with magic seeps into our realm from the realms beyond our own. Magic or the arcane is as unstable and volatile as the realms that produce it. Casting magic requires being well versed in our canting. Then we have a breakdown of spell sheets. All spells are formatted the same way and follow this example. Example spell. You can sense the immensely powerful example here. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh. Because oh. it's Trevor being meta. Mm-hmm. Let's see, diffi- difficult, then the difficulty, then the range, then the duration, then the cooldown. And this is an example spell that has one, two, three, or four D6 sentences. Clearly, he only cast a novice level. Mm hmm. Oh. And rolled and rolled a one. A spell's difficulty is what must be rolled on an arcanting check to manifest the spell. A spell's duration indicates the cast time. If it is a channel spell and how long it lasts. If the spell is an instant spell, it is immediately cast and requires no channel. 
The same spell cannot be cast on the same target already under the effect of the spell. And he pointed he pointed this out in bold. So no spells. St- this you all know what this is. This is a TTRPG that is forcing rotations. Well, and, and <laughs> it's it's only if it's something that has a lasting effect. Mm-hmm. So if if they're under the effect of a spell that says they put down a seven by seven area and they're within that seven by seven area. And you try to shoot the same spell at them again, it's just going to fizzle when it gets into that area. Mm-hmm. But if it's an if it's an instant damage spell that doesn't do anything else other than damage, well, you could do it again. Yeah, so technically it's still rotations, just not in the same sense. It's a rotation of your big spells, with your global cooldown being the ones where you're shooting pebbles at them. Mm-hmm. You know, good old GCD. <laughs> so... Then we have cooldown, which is how long it takes for the spell to recharge. It cannot be cast again until cooldown time is passed, and cooldown does not begin until the spell's duration is complete. Uh, I remember when oh. some I remember when some people were bitching about the cooldown counters in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Third Edition. Yeah, there seems to be this idea that that um that cooldown is some is something that you can't do in TTRPGs. I don't agree with that. And here we actually see a really good implementation of cooldown. Um, well, even even with that, there is the whole um, there was the, there was the whole every other turn thing for high level fighters back in AD and D second edition, mm-hmm. where they could get um, three they could get three attacks every two rounds. Yeah, which. Um, Unfortunate, well, three full attacks every two rounds. Unfortunately, they didn't do a good job of explaining what exactly that was going to mean round to round. I had interpreted it as a as a one two one two approach. Mm-hmm. But the player's handbook never outright set never outright um, clarified that. Yeah. And so this also harkens back to a lot of the spells that we've already read when we read both the duration and the and the cooldown. And in some cases, the cooldown was shorter than the duration. We hadn't specified that that doesn't begin until after the duration is over. Mm-hmm. So if something has a duration of four rounds and a cooldown of three rounds, then until the four-round duration is over, the three-round cooldown does not begin. Ultimately, in, in the end, that means that you're technically waiting seven rounds to cast that same spell again. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you've got other tools in your toolkit until then. So <laughs> this is I'd say this is the reason why. Um, why it why we've said that we said that it's easy to get into in this game. It's also easy to get a very healthy amount of spells, especially at high levels. And especially if you're a Thaumatech. <laughs> if you're a Thaumatech, you've got damn near all the damn spells. Y- your spells have spells. Mm-hmm. Literally. That's what those USB editions are. Yeah. And um. <laughs> Next is, re- is range. How far it may be cast and if it is an area spell or a cone spell. Area spells usually have number by number on it, indicating how many squares it covers. Cone spells have a number cone on it, indicating how many squares it covers in front of you. With area spells, choose a center square and then create a box centered on it using the number of the area field, and it gives a good diagram of it. If it is a cone spell, start from the square in front of your model and count successively in a cone shape. The farthest the cone can go is nine squares wide before it will then go in a straight line covering all squares in that direction. A cone slash line area field cannot be used diagonally. Which makes sense, but um, I'd just like to point out that this means that cone spells that have a range higher than nine are nine wide at the furthest point, and... Too much Super Robot Wars? Because it feels like you played too much Super, Ro- Super Robot Wars. <laughs> in how lots of the map attacks work in Super Robot Wars. 
That's a that's a question that can go both ways, Zan. Of course, if you're day on your gun, there's no such thing as me playing too much Super Robot Wars. I am an exception. Uh huh. Anyway, <laughs> I am I am glad that it's um that it points out that you start from this that you start from a square in front of you because um that caused a few arguments back in the day when none of us knew yep. any better. Yep. Oh. So then we have the Arcanting skill. When attempting to manifest a spell, you must perform an Arcanting skill check against the spell's difficulty. Almost every spell has a specific difficulty test to cast. Most spells are cast as an action unless otherwise stated. If you are not an Arcanting class and learn Arcanting, you use Mentality or Judgment to cast. If you attempt to use Power and you are not a, necro- a Necromancer, you roll with minus one bonus die. Yep. Only a, only a Necromancer can... He did that on purpose. By the power of Grayskull, Monk. <laughs> I have the power! <clears throat> he did that on purpose. He did that on purpose, and I will not hear anything. Would it surprise you at this point? Anything else of, of it? Absolutely not. <laughs> so then we have casting requirements. Our canting in Veil of the Void is done through a mage drawing specific runes with their hands. When casting, you're required to have at least one hand free. You cannot dual wield and cast at the same time. If you are dual wielding and wish to cast a spell, you must perform a rearm movement action to remove a single weapon or shield and then cast. I believe that we, I believe we've covered a few ways to bend that. Yeah, there was the um, the little hand familiar you could get. I forget which class it was that could mm-hmm. basically do the runes for you. Because mm-hmm. that's a simple action. Although if you can't do, if you can't dual wield them, does this mean that you also can't use two handers? You would likely have to pull one hand off the two hander. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I would I would assume that that's the case. The other question is, of course, the whole multiple arms thing. Well, monk, if you'll remember, the dwarves can uh, can dual wield twice. Or they can wield two two-handed weapons. Um, so I'm guessing you could dual wield once and still cast magic. <laughs> <laughs> and that just makes dwarves even more overpowered than they were. <laughs> now all they need is a beard. All the art I saw, they're kind of they're kind of fresh faced. We'll have to get. We'll have to commission somebody to do that. To do that. Oh, um, add that. Add that to the pile right alongside. Right alongside our dwarven druid Ang- Angus. Did we finally decide his name was Angus? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mostly Maybe because those... Angus sounds like anger. Well, I mean, <laughs> my name is Angus. I speak for the trees. Get the fuck out of my swamp before I take out your knees. <laughs> <clears throat> Hold on. My name is Angus. I speak for the trees. Get your dumb knife ears out in the forest before I cut off your knees. <laughs> there you go. Yep. So Angus lives. <laughs> next is multi-realm magic. Magic is drawn from a specific realm. There are currently four realms that produce magic. Each spell tree has its own style and effects. Any spell in these trees with an asterisk next to its name means that only the class it is under may learn that spell. Spells which, may learn... Go ahead. I was going to say, we, we, which we covered when we covered those classes. We, we noted which were exclusive and which were not. Mm-hmm. Um, standard fare for the rest of the class features. Mm-mm. Casters may learn spells from any spell tree except for the Natura tree. Only naturalists have a strong enough bond with the Adareth realm to use its magic. 
The default spell tree of each class is as follows. Thalmatech, Arcane, Air, Earth, Fire, Water, Not Heart, Never Heart, Naturalist, Natura, Mimic, Reflection, Necromancer, Ether. Would you say the Naturalist would be Heart, then? I'm not going to dignify that, because fuck Captain Planet. You're right. We'll, we'll have Captain Death instead in the Necromancer. <laughs> Um, next, we have spell leveling. At level 1, you may cast novice level spells. At level 5, you may cast apprentice level spells. At level 10, you make adept spells. And at 15, mega spells. Superlative spells are gained at level 20 for our canting classes only. And we again, we noted that in the classes before with the spell upgrade feature that each of those classes gets at 5, 10, 15, and 20, respectively. And some might, <clears throat> some might, some might say that that um, it's going that it's going to give casters a bit uh, a bit much of an advantage getting superlative spells, as we've covered in the past. Just because you have a superlative spell doesn't necessarily mean it's a good idea to use it. If you crit fail that thing, you've just killed everybody. Yeah, including yourself. So each, so anyway, every spell has listed in their information section what happens at each level. Example, the soul feed spell of the Aether spell tree does 1d6 damage at novice level, 2d6 at apprentice, 3d6 at adept, and 4d6 at magus level, represented as 1, 2, 3, 4d6. As an Arcanting yep. class levels up, you gain additional spells based on your class. See each Arcanting class chart for on their class page. If you are not an Arcanting class but took the Arcanting skill, you learn plus two additional spell of the equivalent spell level at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20, which we already covered. Mm-hmm. When we covered Arcanting as a skill. And then we get to the thing that says, what's stopping, what's stopping your casters from nuking? Well, <sighs> that's where we get to talk about the charge state. I love this mechanic. I really do. All realm magic energy travels through the arcane current. Most mortal beings have at least a small connection to this current. Magic users, known as mages or casters, learn to manipulate this energy to cast spells. As they cast spells, they collect realm energy inside of them, making it more difficult to cast. This is represented by the charge state. Each Arcanter has their own charge state for every realm with a total of 12 points in each. Each spell successfully cast from the same realm adds a point to its respective realm's charge state. After six points have been added to the charge state, the overcharged effect takes place on all spells cast from the overcharged realm until reduced below six again. Over overcharged. Reduce spell cool... Increase spells cooldowns by plus two rounds, double time based spells cooldowns, plus one spell difficulty level, and minus one bonus die on spell arcanting checks cast from the same realm. The overcharged effect does not prevent you from continually casting spells, it simply makes it more difficulty, typo, to do so. It lasts until the charge state is reduced to six and below. It takes a long rest to fully reduce all realm charge states to zero. A short rest reduces it by six. Of course, Thal Thalmatex learn a skill that allows them to reduce a, a single realm's charge state to zero mm -hmm. uh, during a short rest. But this, this part here, long rest, short rest, reducing charge states, this is much more reasonable as a long rest, short rest limitation than cannot cast this spell again until long rest mm -hmm. that we've seen in D&D. And then uh, my favorite part of the charge states is this next little section here. Mystic spells and spells with no cooldown and or difficulty do not add to a charge state. So there were some spells we noted that have no cooldown. Um, most of them were arcanting attack spells. And so... No cooldown, no charge state increase. But you can think of this sort of as uh, 
as the charge increase as you cast and the residual charge is left over the caster is becoming a resistor like like in an actual circuit mm-hmm. uh, thus causing higher and higher impotent Im- impotence it's a d not a t impotence uh to the actual arcane energy going through them it's really fun to think about mm-hmm. um and well we'll go into more detail about this later if a caster is in a realm is in the realm with which they're casting the spell from so for example a necromancer is in the endscape and casts ether spells charge state does not go up because they're not coming through the arcane current anymore no but we'll get to that later Mm-hmm. Um, then it repeats what we mentioned earlier. The same spell cannot be cast on the same target under already under the effect of that spell. Yes. Then we get to critical spell failure, and this is where it's important to not fuck up. Don't fuck up! <laughs> Losing control of a spell is not unheard of and usually leads to some dangerous outcomes. On a critical fail roll, you lose control of the spell, causing devastating effects to yourself and those around you. When a spell, if a spell critically fails, it goes out of control. When this happens, roll 2d6 and measure that distance in squares from the PC who critically failed. The spell then manifests as a chaotic rift in the square. Based on the spell level, all beings in a 3x3 three three or 5x5 five five or 7x7 seven seven or 9x9 nine nine area take 5, 15, 25, or 35 chaotic damage. Each round after, the area ex- field expands by 1, moves 1d6 squares towards a random mage and deals the damage again. And remember that the area field can only become a maximum of 13 by 13. Mm-hmm. The area and damage scale b- scale by novice, apprentice, adept, and magus. The out-of-control spell will end after 3, 6, 9, or 15 rounds. So, for example, a spell that is out of... And also, a spell that is out of control can be canceled if you succeed at a tough 5 or canting check. Basically, if you fuck up Royal on an Adept spell, uh, we roll 2d6, we put a center point 2d6 squares away from you, and there's a 7x7 field now dealing 25 chaotic damage every round as it moves. It expands bigger, and it moves towards random mages. And it'll it'll go out, it'll, it'll end after 9 rounds. 9 rounds of this random jumping, growing, eating, damaging damage. Thing, uh, that if you continue to allow it to stay out there for nine rounds, you're probably going to end up killing yourself. So better make that tough five or canting check to cancel that fucker. Mm-hmm. But that's but just then, with the basic four t- tiers. For a superlative, yeah. if you fuck up a superlative spell, and this is why I said just because you have... It, just because you have a top tier spell doesn't mean it might be a good idea to use it. Yep. If and it, su- doesn't even re- it doesn't even require critical fail either. Mm-hmm. If a superlative fel- spell fails, not critical fail, just fail, it will go out of control regardless of critical fail. The failed spell then appears on a 25 by 25 area field on top of the caster. All beings inside of the area take 50 chaotic damage. A out-of-control superlative spell cannot be canceled and lasts for 20 rounds. This is what what we meant by if you fail, you've probably just killed yourself and everybody else. Mm-hmm. 25 by 25 area field. If we're using the squares to represent 5 feet, that's 125 foot square. That's huge. Everybody's dead. 50 chaotic damage around 20 rounds. Unless you guys get the hell out of dodge real, real fast... Say a field knight getting the hell out of dodge real, real fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're gonna die. So, how many how many feet did you say? So, if each square counts as five feet, mm-hmm. and it's a twenty five by twenty five foot area or twenty five by twenty five square uh, area field, that's one hundred and twenty five feet squared. That doesn't sound like a lot. That is almost that is almost 
half the length of a football field. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's fucking huge. You, you would have to run like the goddamn wind, and you're still at least going to take fi- at, le- at least 50 chaotic damage for the one round that you're in it. Mm-hmm. See, then we get to Dangerous Cast. Once a realm's oh charged... Once a realm's charge state has hit its max of 12 points, 12 successfully cast spell, it reaches a dangerous point. At this point, any additional spells cast from the same realm spell tree are considered to have critically failed on a standard fail. On a naturally rolled critical critical fail, the spell opens a tear in the void, dealing 20% of the player character's max HP and chaotic damage to all beings in a 7x7 area field, Centered on the caster. Meaning he also does 20% of his max HP to himself. Mm Mm-hmm. So, yeah, don't fuck up. But you'll notice here that there's there's a very important... uh, Very important uh, specification made. Only successfully cast spells increase charge state. Mm Mm-hmm. If a spell fails, your charge state does not go up. So there's no the, – the penalty for failure is the, the spell failed. You didn't get to do anything. You basically wasted an action. There's no extra on top of that unless you crit fail or unless you're in the dangerous cast zone and normal fail. This is why I said, this is why I said on Twitter earlier today that what we have here is a, is – a level of danger akin to cast akin to uh, magic or sight or psychic effects in Warhammer, but it's a little safer. It's a lot safer because <laughs> unlike unlike Warhammer, where any failure can lead to perils of the fucking warp, <laughs> um, and us playing a psyker is always a stupid idea. But we need a Psyker. I don't give a fuck. I'm not playing your Psyker. Somebody else can play them. I'm not going to be the one blamed for accidentally turning everyone into horrors. The only t- the only reason I think some people have the idea that you need, that a party needs a Psyker, is because they've been playing too many fantasy games where you need a healer or a mage. You need a healer? Get an apothecary. They're, pre- they're plenty good. Mm-hmm. But, uh... And it, in Warhammer, you absolutely do need a healer. <laughs> oh, you you fucking need that. So, <laughs> but that's different. Here mm-hmm. we have we have a risk and reward gameplay style, which, as everyone should know at this point, Monk and I both love to death. Um, where the risks are reasonable and the rewards are great. The cost benefit analysis is: Do I cast this spell? Get some charge state. Maybe fail or crit fail it to the point where I cause an oopsie. Or do I hold back and do something else? Because that's the best part about even the dedicated casting classes. There's always something different to do besides cast. Mm-hmm. This isn't a what? case of, you, oh, I, run, I ran out of spell charges. Well, I'm fucked for enough until I do my, until I do my eight-hour rest. Yeah. Y- you aren't defanged when you can't cast anymore or if you choose not to cast you aren't defanged i mean when we went over the necromancer there's a whole bunch of shit they can do without casting by just killing shit and taking souls Mm -hmm. they could summon up little beings to fucking help them kill shit more efficiently too and none of that cause, causes charge state to increase unless it were to specifically stay, say so, because it's not spell casting. Mm-hmm. So there is plenty to do if you're like, well, shit, I've got like eight charge state right now. This makes everything harder to cast, and I really don't want to fuck this up. Then do something different. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Yeah, and, and then we get to casting within a realm. When successfully ca- casting a spell inside of its origin realm, 
for example, casting an arcane spell in the arcane realm. Sorry. You do not add a point to the charge state. While in a spell's origin realm, you are manipulating the magic directly from that realm instead of the arcane current. You ignore the charge state even at 7 plus points while casting a spell fully inside its origin realm. So in other words, yank the enemy into the origin realm and then nuke. Yeah, if you can. Yeah, um, and there were there were spells that uh, Trevor in both explicitly said in some spells and then later told us about uh, other spells because it didn't seem the same. Um, in the in the superlative or near superlative magus spells, um, that actually pour the realm itself into the area you're in, mm-hmm. which acts the same way as this. Yeah. Then then we get to our canting attacks. An attack spell's difficulty is based on the target's armor. This attack rolls with plus two bonus dice and ignores the minus one bonus die and plus one spell difficulty from the overcharged effect. It is still affected by the plus two round cooldown and the dangerous cast effect. Attack spells add your virtue to damage. Yep. So once again, even if you're overcharged, it doesn't mean you're defanged. Yep. And then, of course, we get to uh, the section... Unlimited <laughs> Spellcasters may manipulate their spells to craft something new and aren't encouraged to do so. No wizard is ever bound to just their basic spells. Any good mage builds off what they know to create something even better. When casting a spell, you may attempt to change it into something else within boundaries. This could be anything from changing a damage from changing damage type to combining and crafting it with other spells. The GM will then decide a higher difficulty you need to meet when casting. If you succeed, the spell does what you wanted it to do. Then we get an example. Suppose you cast Fire Blast from the Arcane skill tree, but you are attacking a Water Elemental. Unfortunately, you have no Lightning or Earth spells, so you attempt to manipulate the spell. The GM says the difficulty would be hard instead of average. On a success, you inflict Lightning damage instead of the original Fire. Like everything in this game, spells are only limited by your imagination. And there you get the final, probably the best part about casting, tweaking. You tweak the spells here and there to do maybe not fully what they were intended to do, but to still be useful. So, for example... Going to again an a Thaumatech with their arcane magic and the whole turning the fire blast into lightning to damage water. That's that's a pretty simple uh pretty simple one. But imagine using uh a naturalist's magic to to do something a little different than usual. What that would be? I don't know. The naturalist is pretty is pretty unique on its own. So there's a bunch of different things to be done with some of the more unique classes, such as the naturalist and necromancer, or the mimic. <laughs> <laughs> there's much tweaking to be done with their spells to try and change things up just a little bit here or there. And it's only the GM who goes, mm, okay, you can do that, but it's going to be this this much harder to do that you then decide to go forward with it. Or you could probably just say, "Mm, never mind, I'll do something else. Because it all occurs before the roll. So if if you choose not to do that, you can do something different. Again, Mm -hmm. so much to do in this game. And then we get to the Mystic Arcane. Which this is ba- this is basically going to be the arcane spell tree or the universal spell list, which is also why it doesn't increase your excuse me your um your charge state because you're not casting from another realm. Mm-hmm. Now any all classes can learn any spell from this list. These are all novice level and do not add stages to a charge state. 
So even if you're overcharged from realm spells, you have these at your at your disposal. Yeah. Um, although I would like most of these look very much like uh, utility. Mm-hmm. So first one we have is Arcanic Identification. You focus upon upon the connection to reveal if any magic exists within an item. Okay, detect magic. No so, difficulty. Range is touch. Duration is 10 minute cast time. Cooldown is none. Channel this ability for 10 minutes, focusing on an item. After the full 10 minutes, you can identify what the item is. You can determine without casting the spell whether an item is magical or not. Just by having the spell, you can go, oh, that's a magical item. Mm-hmm. And then casting identify tells you exactly what it is. Although to GMs, to GMs everywhere out there, please, for the love of God, do not say that it has a mysterious aura. All you're going to do is piss me off. Wait, people still say mysterious aura? I just had to get that one bad habit that some people have out of my system. Understood. See, so next is commit to memory. Axel, you stay over there. Got it. Memorized. <laughs> the connection can improve one's memories. Difficulty is none. Range is self. Duration is one hour focus. Cooldown is 12 hours. Study a form of written work no longer than 25 pages, such as data pads, books, and ancient scrolls, for an hour and commit its information entirely to memory. Each additional hour you focus allows you to remember an additional 25 pages, max of 100 pages. This information cannot be erased except by powerful magical means or spells. Seriously, got it memorized? <laughs> So next is creation. The simplest ideas often spawn the loveliest creations. Difficulty is none. Range is self. Mentality in squares. Duration instant. Three minutes. Cooldown is none. Create a small, non-threatening effect or item within your hands or mentality range of squares. This could be anything from a small spark of dancing light to a sip of cold water. These effects last for three minutes each, and you may only have three of these effects active at once. Some examples are below. A small swirling galaxy within your hands. A whisper by someone's ear. A tiny carved trinket worth no credits, but often brings smiles with it. It's better thaumaturgy or prestidigitation or any of those particular cantrips. Mm -hmm. Do something cool and... and It's essentially, do something cool as a special effect. Yeah. So next is Drift the Connection. You have discovered a way to ride along the Great Connection. Dif- difficulty is none. Range is self. Duration is extra action. 25 minutes. Cooldown is 5 minutes. Ride along the flow of the Arcane Current. The spell grants you the ability to fly, quote-unquote, through the air. You gain a fly speed of 12 squares. The oh. realm drifting? <laughs> I was going to avoid it, but I I knew it was coming. I had to decide whether I wanted multi-current, multi-connection, or multi-realm. Multi-realm made the most <laughs> sense. So next is Hack Code. This spell manipulates the small arcane current that resides in many technological items. Cont- difficulty is a contested arcanting check. Range is 15 squares. Duration is instant. Cooldown is three rounds. Target an item or mecha- or mechanized unit and perform a contested arcanting programming check. On a success, you hack into the target. You may inflict 10 electrical damage to a living or manned machine or perform one of its actions. If the target is not a controlled being, you may choose to overload its system, sending out a shockwave in a 5x5 area field centered on it and inflicting 15 force damage or gain basic access to the machine. You could say they're hacking to the gate. <laughs> and if nobody gets that Steins Gate reference, I don't give a fuck. Play and or watch it. Ignore the Steins Gate Zero anime. Mm-hmm. Also, bring Dr. Pepper. Duke P. <laughs> uh, 
But spell ha- spell hacking, one would think that uh, one would think that I would have issues <clears throat> with this, given how for years I've bitched about the presence of the knock spell in D anD. I I don't have an issue here be- for one simple reason: it's not automatic. Not only is it not automatic, it has a cooldown, so you can't mm-hmm. just do it over and over and over again. And uh, what's really funny is you are limited on the actions you can take. Mm-hmm. So it does. It doesn't. So it's not like it steps into the, onto the toes of uh, of other um, builds or other classes. And if I remember correctly, one of the actual tech wizardry classes in the game actually gets hack code just because. Mm-hmm. So next is Heat Infusion. You focus upon the Greater Flame and summon a small strand of its power. Difficulty is, n- difficulty is none. Range is touch. Duration is instant, 10 minutes. Cooldown is 5 minutes. Superheat your hands enough to weaken metal and melt metallic items. You can channel the spell for up to 10 minutes. Only heats items that you touch and the air immediately around your hands. Blacksmiths use this. Mm-hmm. Oh, you Here close is- Oh, you close the blast doors. Okay, let me give you a hand with that. <laughs> Actually, let me give you two. <laughs> Dwarf pops up. I can give you four. <laughs> yeah, just get Use heat infusion for te- for ten minutes. That's enough time to probably get through the do- get through the closed doors. I mean, it's just like the lightsaber getting through the closed blast door scene, except this time it's your hand, so it's a much bigger hole. Mm-hmm. So next is memo. Your memo. Your memo. Your memo. Your memo. Hmm. You can send a quick memo into the mind of another. Difficulty none, hard four, range ten squares, duration instant, cooldown five rounds. Send a sentence that can clearly be said within ten seconds time to another individual within range. During a short rest, you may perform a hard four or canting check and make a rune pact with another willing target. You and the target may telepathically converse one another freely for an hour and up to one planet away. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. It'd also be a good way to. I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that with enough prep, enough prep, you could potentially stack this so you ha- so you have a telepathic network. Um, probably. It'd be more like telepathic telephone because it's a it's one other being. Even even with that, it's still it's still essentially you can still essentially do the keeper enforcer thing, except without all the sucking. Because mm-hmm. yeah, that was a letdown. All that t- all that talk about how about how badass the keeper enforcer's training is to the point where they com- they only they don't communicate using using sound. And they and they get jo- and they get jobbed out by the fucking hammerites. <laughs> I don't hate de- I don't hate um, Deadly Shadows as far as the Thief games. I just find it a I just find it a very unpolished. Yeah. Largely because trying to having a bunch of PC developers try and make a game for the Xbox was a mistake. One that uh, Microsoft sort of learned. Although to be fair, there were um, there were big there were bigger targets from coming out of Ion Storm. <laughs> yeah. Even even at that time, I would sooner play Deadly Shadows than play Invisible War again. I'm not going to dignify that with a response. Anyway. Next, next, appropriately enough, is memory adjustment. Sometimes it is best to share or be rid of a memory. 
Contest difficulty contested are canting, range five squares, duration instant, cooldown ten minutes. You may can't you may choose to share a simple group of memories with another. What precisely they see, hear, and learn is up to you. Or you may attempt to remove a single memory too. Another piece another, another, that you, another PC, or an adversary has. In either case, the other individual may attempt a contested judgment check to resist. Well, now we know how the men in black oper operate in this world. Yeah. Um, Got to be a little bit harder than just flashing an item. Mm-hmm. Even so, even so, probably probably opening it up with saying sorry. <laughs> but next is power item. You supply a power source to an electrical item. Difficulty is easy too. Range is touch. Duration is instant. Thirty minutes. Cooldown is fifteen minutes. Power up a small to medium armor for the duration listed. Medium item. Mm -hmm. Medium arm. item. What? You said armor. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking there. Too much mecha on the brain, monk. Oh, like you're one to talk. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so next is scene reconstruction. You use Arcana Tech and Shadow Essence to reconstruct the scene. Difficulty is average 3, range is touch, 15 by 15, duration is instant, cooldown is 10 minutes. Touch an item or being and focus on the individual's past to reconstruct the scene for up to 15 minutes in their past. You cannot see detail, only basic shadowy outlines. Example, you hold a dagger in your hand and see that 5 minutes ago it was used to stab a silhouetted individual. Why am I thinking of Willem Dafoe's character in Boondock Saints? Dark Saints. <laughs> I don't know. Why are you thinking that? <laughs> I could go. I could go with either that or um, or some or the way Detective Vision became. In how many games now? Mm -hmm. Oh, from from Arkham City onward, the ridiculousness that Detective Vision became. Oh, I know, but there are a bunch of other games that have that type of. Supervision as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, as much as I love The Witcher Three, I'll call that out. Witcher Vision is a thing. Yeah. Next is see the current. You can sense the threads of the arcane current. Difficulty is easy. Range is self forty square radius. Duration instant. is instant. Ten minutes. Cooldown is ten minutes. Upon casting, you see the threads of the arcane current dancing throughout your 40-square range. These threads wrap and dance around magical items. Whenever magic is cast within your range, energy quickly rushes toward the origin of the spell being conjured. Individuals linked to the arcane current have a thread linked to it, and you may discover it unless the individual attempts to hide the link by making a contested arcanting check, or if they have a minuscule link to it. So that's a good way to do magical tracking. Magical tracking and or um, countercasting when you can't see. Mm -hmm. So next we have see the fate strings. And this is the one that was uh, that was renamed um, as a carryover from Fateless One. Because mm -hmm. in Fateless One, I believe it was called. Uh, where is that one? See the connection. Mm -hmm. Here it's called See the Fate Strings. And anyways, you can sense both light and dark forces swirling around you. Difficulty is easy too. Range is self, 10 squares. Duration is instant, 10 minutes. Cooldown is 10 minutes. See the fate strings around beings, PCs, NPCs, and adversaries close to you. The strings glow a bright white, dull gray, or crimson red based on the unit's potential choices. If a unit has the arcane expertise, 
They may perform a contested or canting check to hide their aura. If cast at a tough difficulty or higher, it also determines if an adversary has a demon or divinal bloodline or has recently been in contact with them. Does not work on individuals with the Fateless One expertise. You can't tell if I've been talking to devils or angels. Fuck you. <laughs> and that covers all of the all of the spells in the Mystic Tree. And yeah, the spells that are the, the more combative spells are are t- are more tied to the spell trees for for the classes. Yeah. Although it's a bit of a misnomer for me for us to say that because even if you even if you're say a mimic that doesn't necessarily mean you're cut off from up from dipping into other spell trees. Yes. As long as they're not exclusive. Yes. The only spell tree that no other cast no other class can have is the Natura spell tree. That stays with the naturalists. Mm-hmm. But even even a mimic or even a even a necromancer, any any of them can take spells from their own spell tree, but they could take spells from arcane or reflection as well. Arcane reflection or either, depending on who they are, etc. Mm-hmm. There's there's no limit to that. But just like that, there's also you know, le- there's skills that the, that they get, their features that they get during their leveling up that can also be swapped out with features from other classes Mm -hmm. you can create a frankenstein's monster of weirdly effective proportions if you really want to i wonder i i kind of wonder uh how munchkin can a munchkin get with this system Probably not as much as as other systems because there are still there are still even with the amount of stuff that you can potentially do, it's not like this is completely formless. There are catches. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering exactly. That, that, that's a little bit of curiosity that I'd like to know from Trevor. What's the worst Munchkin build he's ever seen in his own system? I can't help. I, uh, it would be tempting for someone to say that Thalmatex could get Munchkiny, but I don't see it. There's a potential for Munchkin in all of these. I mm-hmm. just wonder which would be the most effective. Yeah, I, I don't go fishing for mun- for Munchkinness unless it's absolutely warranted. As someone who participated in the forums during the pun pun the magic kobold discussions, Munchkin as a thought experiment has always uh, always fascinated me. So, and I I can understand that, and I I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy certain dumbass builds that people have made. Exactly. Um, the laser the um, magic missile laser circus comes to mind. Okay, Itano. <laughs> uh, Harmony Gold should let go of their license so we can get Macross again. Mm-hmm. As well, as well as just as well as just stop be stop being a royal pain for Catalyst. I mean, it's Harmony Gold, mm-hmm. but that's neither here nor there, Monk. Yeah. Now. Next week, we will be tackling equipment. I get the feeling it's going to be a semi-light episode when we do that. Mm. I do think, however, that one thing that one thing that we one thing that I will be curious about when you when we do equipment is, um, as I mentioned, cybernetics. Not just because of the extra arm thing, although that's always although anybody can make do with an extra arm. Um, especially, especially say the soldiers, so he has more ways to shoot you, or stab you, or cast magic at you. Mm-hmm. And even even if you can't, even if um extra arms wouldn't count for ma- for magic use, 
there's still other means that they can be utilized. And use it for a weapon. That way you have a normal arm free for magic use. Mm-hmm. Or just drop the hand, or just drop the hand part of it and put a and put a laser on the end of it. Arm cannon. Okay, you're Mega Man now. Oh, I was go- I was gonna go with the extra arm that in the- with the protagonist in they always run, but that works. <laughs> okay. Or the third arm that Justice had. But um, I don't want you to lose your head about that. Heh! You're funny. Yeah, but enough about my looks. So, but with that, with all of that, with all that in mind, that's what we'll be tackling next week. Um, I will have I will have something interesting planned for this Sunday that you, that you'll all see very soon, and. I and we are we are getting very very close to the end of our look through Veil of the Void. Indeed. There, there will be some there will be some um extra stuff we'll be do we'll be doing after our conclusions. But that's going to get listed as a bonus episode. So with with all that in mind until until next we meet on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>